Is this a succulent for GI? Why is there no? There's. Why, I feel like this should be a poop. Nikki. What? Like it was dumped up. Like we had the. There's so many people at home. Hello, home friends. Huge. Are you out there? Oh, it's my Halloween shirt. Can you see it? I've got to wear them. I've only got three days to fit them all in. Huge. Are you guys staying warm? It's like 21 degrees outside. Vicky just left me alone while she goes to urinate, and so I'm just going to keep things entertaining here. It's four degrees at your house. Snow, where the heck do you live? Oh my gosh, white flakes of death already? I can't handle it. Oh, sick. I don't have snow. All right. I am here to announce the winners of Skills Olympics. This is like blinding. How does she function in this? Okay, so the winning team, are you ready for this? Umbilicus is the winning team. Yay! But I don't think any of those numbers are. Oh, there's one. There's one. Okay. So look at Braden and Kylie and Shelby and. Emily, Emily, yes, yes, Emily. Okay, so see, we have these beautiful medals. They have a stethoscope carved in them. You get to wear this for pinning. I'll bring this up and put this on you. Okay. Oh, Ricky just. Abandoned us. Yeah, I, I can talk about GI disorders. You know, it's one of my favorites. So, if you're not here and you're part of Umbilicus, penis canes, you, I told you you were off by one point. You slacked. So, Umbilicus team members, come see me and I'll have your medals. Victoria's back from her bathroom break and she's ready to get GI. Why didn't you, why didn't you borrow my poop shirt? You want my poop hat? I think they've been pooped out. I think they're pooped. You can never be pooped out. <laughs> okay, people. Wait for Rachel by Rach. She's been covenized. She was put. She says that she was sequestered in her home for two weeks because of COVID. Yeah, do you believe that? No, I think she was ordered by the governor of the state to stay inside and stay there. Can you imagine? Okay. People, welcome back. Hello. Hello, people. Are we recording by any chance? Oh, she is recording. I'm so happy. So, hello. Oh, let me take this off. Woo! I just got through looking at the test for a few minutes, and it was the highest average that we've had so far. I think you all deserve a big clap. Clap on the back. Don't get the clap, but clap on the back. But also, here's the Are you ready? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? I know I'm throwing out question number 11. <laughs> Oh, and, and then I'm having um, Chantel look at number 51. I'm not for sure oh, she's going to throw that one out yet. No, but uh, there was a choice there that was made. Uh, one of the distractors was chosen more often than one. It was a select all that apply question. But uh, one of the distractors was chosen more than the right answer. So, and here's this, the one, the number 11 for me was, okay, so um, what is the nurse going to do implement for a patient coming into the ER that's complaining of chest pain? 
And basically, we were supposed to go back to the Mona, the Mona for the Corona, the Mona for the Corona. And uh, like a lot of you chose number E that was put 10 liters of oxygen with a non rebreather mask. <laughs> it's not it, people. Remember, we talked about low oxygen. We're starting, you're just starting at two liters. We're going to slap that on them and then slap it. And then remember in the lecture, we talked about titrating that oxygen to uh, maintaining a level of 95% or better. So uh, that that is way too much oxygen. Yes, you will, by golly. But um, anyway, so that was thrown out. But remember, we start them low. Go low. So... That's the answers. Now, I didn't like bed rest either. That's not hard. It was better than what? It's not part of Mona. What? Bed rest. It didn't say put. Well, oh, no, no, no. We're talking about decreasing activity. Yes, for a little bit, we're going to decrease activity. But was that one of the question yeah. things? It was bed rest, I think, was a distractor. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's our schedule for the next two days. Today, we're going to talk about GI assessment and upper GI, and then we go to 11.50 today, and then tomorrow at 8 a.m., we are going to take a quiz for 15 minutes, quiz tomorrow morning, and then I teach for uh, 45 minutes, and then Chantel has um, an obligation to do, so she's going to come in and do her however long she has and then i'm going to finish up with liver failure Woo! doesn't that sound exciting more than you know so we have a quiz scheduled tomorrow at 8 a.m don't forget be there be square and then um we also have a learning activity now the past two or three lectures we haven't been able to do because time has been so short and I'm not going to force you to do a learning activity. No, by golly, I'm not. But tomorrow there will be one. So we'll have a learning activity during class tomorrow. And then uh, this today and tomorrow will be on Monday's test. So are we all good on the agenda? What is on your plan? Oh, I didn't tell you about the exam, too. So before the one or potentially two questions were thrown out, the class average was 84%. Which is damn good, people. Damn good. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Give yourself a pat on the back or drink some Malibu and Coke. I know I did. All right. So I'm moving out of the picture. How sad is that? I know. Oh, you want me to look at this? How's that, people? Okay. Is that good for the people at home? Answer yes, because I can't see you. Everybody, does anybody look at the side picture? I don't know if anybody, yeah, everybody can see. Can you turn it more towards you? I think it's kind of skewed. Kylie. Kylie? Yes. Speak up. Turn your volume up. Can you hear me now? Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I am so excited about this, people. Why? Oh, we didn't. I didn't hear her. I think she quit talking. Okay, so here are the objectives that we're going over today. Identify components of the abdominal assessment. I sure hope you know what they are by now. Identify clinical manifestations of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. There you go. Identify important teaching measures for patients and their family support system regarding controlling reflux. Differentiate between the clinical manifestations and medical management of the various types of peptic ulcer diseases. Identify, and there's more than one people, more than one. Identify clinical manifestations and therapeutic interventions for a child with pyloric stenosis, that ain't me. Prioritize nursing interventions for a patient experiencing an upper GI bleed. And Cassie, are you here today? I don't see you in the light. Cassie must be at home. Oh, yeah, she had a GI bleed on clinicals. Oh, Cassie's a PM1, sorry. 
Never mind, but she had a GI bleed on uh, on Saturday in clinicals, and they literally had to change the sheets on the bed four times that day. He was just bleeding out. They pumped in four uh, units of packed red blood cells, trying to keep him breathing. Identify, yes, ma'am. Kylie's saying that you need to turn the camera a little bit more for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell her to type the word good, good, when it's ready. It was good? I can't see it moving. That look good? You can't what? I can't see it moving. Is it frozen? She can't see what? She can't see it moving. Is it frozen? Oh, it, no, I was, no, I haven't moved the interventions because we're adjusting the camera angle. Maybe we should make this a job. Somebody that adjusts the camera angle. Are we good? I think she wants you to turn the laptop towards you. I am. Oh, the whole laptop. She's going slow. I'm going wow. slow so she can have time to type good. It's fine, Vicki. I can look back through it later. What did she say? She said it's fine. You can look back through it later. Oh, bless your heart. I want you guys to be able to see as we go because I'm going to point with the cursor. <laughs> Who's got their laptop in here? Who can see it? You can see it. Is that good? Are we all good? We really just okay. Compare the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Identify people at risk for the development of cirrhosis of the liver. Identify the metabolic abnormalities and common complications of cirrhosis of the liver. Interpret laboratory data used to assess liver function and identify nursing interventions for the patient experiencing liver failure. All right, let's make it work, people. Let's make it work. At home, is that tip back far enough? Seems like I've had it before a little bit. Okay, I don't know. All right, so here we go, people. This is it. This is your entire GI tract. So the GI tract begins and ends with two holes. We go through the oral cavity down the esophagus, through the esophageal sphincter. What did you say to me? Nothing. <laughs> through the esophageal uh, sphincter into the stomach where the stomach turns it all up with a bunch of gastric. Oh, I see what you're doing. Maybe, maybe, maybe. See, you need to put more. I'm holding it so it doesn't fall over. That's good. That's good. Perfect. 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 Oh, yeah. Money. Of course it's perfect. All right. So uh, it gets all the food gets all churned up in the stomach. The mouth, of course, is chewed it up to make it semi-fluid. And then we go down into the stomach. It gets all churned up, turns into chyme, which is fluid. C-H-Y-M-E goes through the uh, the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum goes into the duodenum three parts to the uh, to the small intestines the duodenum is the first and then the middle part of the 20 feet of small intestines is the jejunum and then the last sphincter in the small intestines is the ileum then we go through the ileal cecal valve, which connects the small intestines to the approximate five feet of large intestines. That's going to be on the lower right quadrant. Then we're going to have the large intestines, the five feet of large intestines, go up the ascending colon, across the abdomen, the transversing colon and then the descending colon 
on the left side of the abdominal wall and then it kind of crass, crosses just a little bit uh, with the column. Did I say column? Like column. <laughs> and, and then we're going to go out the sigmoid uh, uh, colon, and then the rectum, and then the anus. Also sometimes called asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Often referred to that. I can't help it. I'm just giving you the truth, people. Okay, I'm going to draw an arrow. Yeah, make sure. You see these terms interchangeably on the, on the, on the test? Then you know it's the anus. Yeah. Okay. So, here we go. So, with the abdominal assessment, remember, we are doing a focus assessment on the GI tract. So we are going to have a health history and we are going to have a physical history or a physical assessment. So for we're going to talk about the appetite. Where are we? Okay, here we are. Uh, and you remember this from the baseline assessment. Yes, ma'am. Is the abdominal assessment all that's going to be on the quiz tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Thank you for asking. Oh, let me tell you else something about the quiz tomorrow and why that little preview of the complete GI tract is so necessary for you to memorize because there is a picture, a diagram that you have to fill in the parts to the assessment on, on the quiz. And some of you have special computers. Yes, you do. So you may pull up the quiz tomorrow and not be able to see that diagram with all its arrows pointing for you to identify. So if you don't, do not spaz because you can come to class whenever the few times what is the next uh, skills, probably at the end, the final skill assessment, come in and I will give you a hard copy of that diagram and you can fill it in and then get your grade. Okay, so don't spaz about tomorrow. Okay, so appetite, remember from your baseline assessment, you are asking them, how's your appetite? Do you have any nausea and vomiting? Uh, what did you eat today? How much of it did you eat today? Blah, 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 blah. Another thing for uh, the uh, health assessment is to ask them, how many, if they've had any weight change, unexplained weight change. I think we've talked about this before. How important is the weight change? Because if you do a short, ter a short period of time and you have a 10, 15, 20% loss in your weight, then there is something that is causing that. We have to investigate that a little bit f further. Then you get to ask that wonderful question, when was your last BM? And then they get to describe it for you. Isn't that fun? And have you noticed in clinicals, people answer that without pause? It's just the strangest thing. If somebody asked me that out on the street, I think I'd turn and walk away. But no, Rachel would answer it in gross detail. She would answer that question, but I personally would not participate in that. But people in healthcare systems or people that are going in for a focused GI assessment, this is perfectly normal. So you don't have to be embarrassed about asking it. We want to look at, uh, did I say asking it? Yeah, asking. Oh, asking. Because <laughs> is that A-S-S-King? <laughs> okay, so medications, we want to talk about their medications. Uh, why do you think medications would be important or any kind of supplement? They can make you constipated, but what else? What can iron do? Turn your poop black. There you go. So if you ask them, do you have black tarry stools? And they say yes, you're going, what? Call the doctor, but you are have already asked, are they taking any medications or supplement? They said, yeah, I take iron, so I'll be strong, and you'll know that that's uh, probably a reason why they're having uh, a black stool. You want to know if they're taking laxatives, and people, 
people, people, only in America, people take laxatives to lose weight. And then guess what happens? Your body becomes dependent on the laxatives. You can't really poop without the laxative. So you need to know, you know, do you take any laxatives? You need to verbalize that for them because they may be hesitant in really admitting to that. Uh, you want to find out if they're taking any herbs or if they do enemas. Yeah, they have those colonic enemas. Who pays for that? I just want to know. Who pays for that without a reason? I don't know. Whatever. All right. Another thing. Have they traveled outside the United States? Why? Parasites. Exactly. Who's ever had a parasite before? Not? I got to tell you, I'll share with you this one thing. I did in California, where else? From the drinking water, where else? But it is the nastiest thing, GI, in the world. Nastiest, nastiest, nasty. Why? Because it never, ever goes away. And then guess what? You have to take in a sample. <gasps> How many of you, when you've gone in for a health assessment recently, have been given a card to take a fecal sample at home and mail it through the mail? What? Back to the doctors? Yes, there you go, Mark. I wouldn't have admitted that if I were you. I had some alcohol after I came home from Mexico for a month. Oh, so you did have problems. Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. But they have to look at the specimen to see if the parasite's there. And so what do you do? You're carrying it around. How fun is that? Yeah, I carried it around. I had to take it to the doctor. But, but or they, you post it in the mail. Yeah, put a stamp on that sucker and send it through the mail. No wonder the post office is in trouble. All right. All right, what are the techniques that we use for... Um, abdominal physical assessment. We're going to use inspection, auscultation. We are not RNs, but I left percussion in there so that you know what order it comes in in the abdominal assessment. Because why? Because this class will be 100% RN licensed in just a year. It's a cat. Less, than. Less than a year. So there you go. There you go, people. All right. So again, there will uh, be able to answer that with or at, without the word percussion. I know there's a question on it somewhere. I just can't remember where. Okay. It's real important to, to have that sequence correctly. Why? That's right, because we don't want we want to know what their bowel is doing at rest. Mm -hmm. We don't want to stimulate peristalsis here. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so in we if we sit there and say person is anorexic, what does that mean? They don't eat. They don't eat. But this, we need to recognize, is a sign or symptom that oftentimes is health-induced. So when you ask the patient, uh, you know, they've had this um, history of short-term weight loss, you know, you may want to ask them what their eating habits are, that type of thing, and uh, explain to them that the, the term anorexic is not the disease process. It's a sign that they're looking at as lack of eating or having no appetite whatsoever. Just the thought of it makes them want to be sick. So make the difference between uh, anorexia and anorexia nervosus, which is more the uh, behavioral issue instead of the physical issue. Um, so, um, never mind that question. I don't want to say it. So there you go. Um, how many of you stress eat? <laughs> yeah, you have to. How many of you eat to stay awake during these fabulous lectures? 
<laughs> yes, you do. You just got to do what you got to do, don't you? So again, this is a question that you want to uh, have is that I don't know why. Tell me the physiological reason as to why it helps. I just don't know. I guess uh, to stay awake, it's just so uh, important. Um, so why would smoking cessation be an issue when we're talking about the GI? Increase in appetite. Yeah, increase in appetite. Yeah. Well, they lead to the potential of cancer, different kinds of cancer. Oh, my gosh. And also smokeless tobacco, which yeah, here in the Utah, I haven't really seen much of that in Oklahoma. I had to pull students from the floor and have them spit it out. I don't know. It's very common back there. Very common. But it can lead to oral cancer can lead to esophageal cancer. But some of the things we're going to talk about today are also potentially uh, a precursor to esophageal cancer. So we're going to talk about that. But smoking or smokeless tobacco is a huge issue. We've already talked about travel outside the uh, United States. Uh, we've talked about parasites. Now, in any state, uh, when you come in and you've been diagnosed with a parasite, the doctor is going to send that information to the Department of Health. Why? This is not syphilis, people. Close to it, but it's not syphilis. So why is the Department of Health interested in knowing that you have a parasite? Who said that? Outbreak. Who said that? Okay, exactly. Right. This is uh, um, an issue that uh, can come from our water source. I got to tell you, the first year I moved to Utah, I was living out in Syracuse, guess what they closed down? No drinking water in Syracuse. Uh, because they had found Giardia in the water source. So if they, the health department's going to call you up, say, okay, where have you been? What have you done? They'll go through a focused uh, health assessment with you again, trying to determine the source of your parasite. Because if they find that multiple people are drinking the same water from the same uh, filtration system, then they are going to put out an alert and tell everybody to boil their water or not drink it, to bottled water only. So just uh, information that if you have a parasite, uh, then it's fine. The, County Health Department will be notified. All right. Then let's move on. Okay, so, and you guys know this again because uh, you learned this as baseline and you moved on to the comprehensive health set, uh, assessment. So now we're looking at inspection. What are we looking for when we're looking at the abdomen? And here's a thought for you. I want you to have this visual, people. It's almost Halloween, so you need this visual in your mind. When I went to school, <laughs> besides walking there, no, I didn't walk. But uh, going to school, we had to perform the baseline assessment and the comprehensive health assessment, either in a swimsuit or your underwear. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So when you sit there through your scrub, I, I went to the University of Tulsa. I did not go to Weber State. Sorry, <laughs> so, so the thing about it is, is yeah, that you talk about stressful eating. That's where I had found out for the first time I had high blood pressure. Wonder why. Anyway, so we're looking. We've got to see. And, and you know, we don't really require you to have your classmate lift their scrubs. Or to look. <laughs> but we just know that when we're doing that, when you ask your patient to do that, you need to um, look and see what you have. It's not something where you just ask, is there, you know, how are you feeling abdominally? You know, have you had any surgeries? Anything like that. You need to look. Had a, a PN1 at clinicals a couple weeks ago find a stage three pressure ulcer on the foot. 
They had been invented for three days. It had never been documented. Why? Because they never took off a guy's socks. You got to look, people. If you're documenting it, you got to look. And why do we document accurately? CYA. There you go. Okay. So we've looked at the contour of the abdomen. We looked at symmetry here. Um, we've seen that we're looking at the umbilicus here to see if it's an any or an Audi. No reveals here. <laughs> no reveals. Okay. So we want to look first. We want to look at the skin characteristics. Is the person potentially hairy? We're looking for striae. What is striae indicative of? Stretch marks. But uh, this is it's from weight gain. Ask any person that ever, any woman that has birthed a child. Ask them. <laughs> yeah, it can be any person. And uh, it's also uh, indicative of Cushing's disease. The difference between the two is that Cushing's is going to have dark purple striae, where somebody that has an excessive weight gain has uh, that is on relatively in a short period of time will have stretch marks. We're looking for any masses. We're looking for scars, any pulsations. Um, and then we can start auscultating. And what we're looking is at four quadrants. And we're looking for circulatory sounds. We learned about that in our vascular quiz because we're looking for, uh, trying to listen for brewies. Now, how is a brewie gonna be different than a bow sound? It's the whooshing thing, exactly. Let's all whoosh together. Let's just do that. Okay. All right. So palpation, I often get a chuckle because never has a PN2 student done this, but PN1s will often uh, palpate in nine quadrants. I guess you've had to listen to like four pass offs to, or 400 pass offs to laugh at that, but it's regions, people. Regions. Quadrants is four. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. Yes. And regions is nine. So we're looking here when we do light palpation, how many hands do we use? How many hands do we use with deep palpation? Exactly. So we get down here and we look at this slide and we look at deep palpation here. Uh, what does rebound tenderness indicate? That's describing it, but what does it indicate? Exactly, itis, inflammation. We're, we're looking at, or we're listening no, we're not. We're palpating <laughs> inflammation here with rebound tenderness. Do we know what organ is inflamed down there? It could be anything. And remember, in the abdomen, for a woman, we've got a uterus and we've got ovaries down there. We're looking at abdomen. So it doesn't, we, we can't identify what exactly is inflamed. If it's the right lower quadrant, what can we start looking for? Appendicitis, Appendicitis thank you. All right, so bowel movements is the funnest thing in the whole world. But what we're looking for, uh, what we're assessing here is for constipation. Um, I get this um, on every semester from a student that the person has constipation, uh, their patients. A lot of it is because of the medication that they're on. Can be diarrhea. We want to ask them if they have black tarry stools or if they see frank blood, bright red blood um, in their stool. Um, this sometimes uh, 
if they have red blood in the stool, we want to assess a little bit further so we can document that they may have, uh, a, we ask the patient if they've ever had a polyp. This is what a polyp is. It is a precursor to cancer. And what happens is as the stool is passing through the colon here, it'll come across this polyp. And depending on how the person is straining or how dry the stool is, it's pushing up against that polyp and that can tear at the base here, causing it to bleed. Now, that's not going to be too much of an issue because we see this little hoop right here. They go in with this little hoop right here and grab that sucker and just yank it off. Now, we want that to be gone because this can grow in to a cancerous tumor, which can potentially occlude the colon. What is clay-colored stools? How, do, how come we would have clay-colored stools? What causes a stool to be brown? The bile. The bile, exactly. So if it's clay-colored, what do you think is going on there? No bile. So we got, we'll potentially start directing some of our investigatory instincts towards lab values to see if there's any elevation in bilirubin there. Mucus in the stools. What is mucus in the stools going to be about? You can get that with C. diff. You can also get that with cystic fibrosis, oh, yeah. huge amount, but, but the colon itself, not the colon, but the entire intestinal tract is a mucus producing organ. So there could be potential, it all depends, is it a one-time thing or is it a multi-use, does it happen frequently or more than once? Okay, so let's talk about uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease. Skip that. Okay, so this is where I cut in. <laughs> Are you ready? Just a minute. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, people. Ah. I'm taking away the picture. I want you to see me. <laughs> I know. How do I look today? Oh, I forgot to put my lipstick. All right. So this is what I wanted to explain to you. So you're coming, you chew up your food, you go down the esophagus, you go through the uh, sphincter, and then the esophageal sphincter, and you go into the stomach here. So the stomach is basically a J-shaped organ. It is uh, muscular in that it goes like this after um, there has been some stimulation from food that's gone into the mouth and then through the sphincter. And there's all these gastric juices that are secreted. Now, it turns into a fluid state. Is it totally clear? No, it's not. But it is at least fluid now. Now, the, the physical law about fluid is that it goes the path of least res, uh, resistance. So you're sitting here and you have gravity, once again, pulling that flow of fluid. <laughs> I just saw. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, she's just yawning. <laughs> My boring lecture, she was yawning. It's okay. Anyway, so you've got this fluid in the bottom of the uh, stomach now that is being pulled there by gravity. Now, again, remember, fluid goes the path of least resistance. So if we lie down and we have eaten a large Thanksgiving meal, and we've churned up all this food now that's fluid, the pressure in the esophagus is less than the pressure in the stomach. We've got all this fluid there, and the fluid is now shifted from 
being at the dependent portion of the stomach. Now it is now once again dependent, but it's a different portion to the stomach and there's a lot of fluid there. And so it's going to go back up through the esophageal sphincter and beware in the esophagus. So this is now we have great potential there because there is time which has the gastric very high acidic secretions in the esophagus esophagus <laughs> connected to the okay so in the esophagus so what do you think is going to happen to that tissue in the esophagus damage, damage. what does damage result in inflammation so a couple of things can happen now. First of all, we have inflammation in that esophagus. Inflammation can lead to scarring. Scarring can cause constriction of the esophagus. Is this a, going to put the person at risk for breathing problems? No. Because constrictors pull the esophagus together here. Yes, you were thinking of the trachea. So you were thinking of what? Oh, okay. So anyway, so you can get constrictors from that, which are going to narrow the lumen to the esophagus, but also they're going to lose their ability, its ability to stretch and come back again, stretch and come back. The acidity has the potential of also when you have... And this happens uh, with smoking as well. When you have this chronic, toxic exposure to this very fragile tissue, then the tissue actually changes. And this is where you can develop esophageal cancer. So ultimately, that is a correct answer if it's chronic and exposed to these secretions on period of time. Now, there's one more thing that happens when a person is laying down and you've got a full stomach. What's going to happen? What's going to put them at risk for? What? That's the whole process. <laughs> it, it, it will definitely, this is GERD. What I'm describing is GERD. But what does it put the patient at risk for? Aspiration, exactly. Why? Because we're going to go the path of re, uh, least resistance here. So uh, I, uh, 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 this is especially true for people that have had a stroke, who have difficulty swallowing neurologically. There's dementia there, and they may not have control of their epiglottis again. No, they don't. So there's a whole lot of problems with food or chyme being in the esophagus. That's exactly what we're describing today is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Wasn't that worth watching me talk about? I thought it was. Okay, so we're back. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Laptop, yes. Blank screen. Oh, I, no, I don't want that. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're coming back. Are we good? Did people see it like they should? It's good? Okay. All right, so GERD is a condition in which gastric secretions reflux into the esophagus. The esophagus can be damaged by acidic gastric secretions and exposure to digestive enzymes. No well, we'll just fix that, by golly. Hold on, people, hold on. Wait a minute, I have to turn it off and turn it on again. <laughs> It, it, no, this is a literally a step that Jody taught me when I was complaining about, let's see if it comes up now.
Mm -hmm. See, off and on. Seventy million dollars. Yeah, right. Okay, so here we go. Um, okay, we've talked about that. Okay, so we're going to the next slide. Okay, uh, let's talk about some signs and symptoms of GERD. Oh my gosh, does this look like a select all that apply question to you? Shoot, it does. There you go. So dyspepsia, uh, regurgitation. Have anybody ever had a little bit of vial in, your, in the back of your throat here where you belch and just boom, it comes right up? Okay, coughing and hoarseness or wheezing at night. Hypersalivation, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. Odinophagia is painful swallowing. Now, I have to tell you people, I had to look up odinophagia. 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 And it's somewhere else written. So we need to know that definition. Epigastric pain, belching, flatulence, nausea, pyrosis, which is where you feel it kind of right down in the back of your sternum. It feels it right up at the very top there. Globus. Laryngitis, dental caries. What do you think? Which teeth are going to be affected by this? Your back molars, uh huh. Possible complication of a esophageal stricture. We already talked about that. And this heartburn this, for one to two hours after eating. This all makes pretty much sense. Yes, girl. Can you wait just a second? Sure. Forward. Only half of the words transferred over on there. What? Let's get over right in the house. When you flip it over to uh, the app that we have, it only did half of it. Oh. Oh. But it helps you pick up. Uh, well, and also it's on Canvas, too. Okay. The PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Just let me know when you're good. I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. So, oh my gosh, this is amazing to me. It's another select all that apply potentially valid question that I can write from this. It's amazing. Two at once. Okay, so we want to eat four to six small meals a day. Eliminate, eliminate. <laughs> Eliminate or limit fatty foods, coffee, tea, cola, and chocolate. Why? Why, 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 why? Don't know. Am I even there yet? Okay, so those type of things, I'm looking here at alcohol and tobacco. I don't think, oh, that's the next one. Oh, never mind. Okay, so we're going to limit these because they stimulate more secretions. Okay, we want to limit or uh, el uh, eliminate alcohol and tobacco. Again, again, it increases the gastric secretions, um, which can cause that pain if, if you have an incompetent esophageal sphincter, or maybe you have a hiatal hernia, or you've just eaten a big old pot of Halloween candy, one or the other. Yes. So why would tobacco stimulate more secretion if you smoke? If you smoke it, I don't know. I gotta pre I, I I gotta be honest with you. I don't know. It just says it stimulates it. I don't know why. 
Okay, so um, let's see. You don't want to snack in the evening, uh, two to three hours before going to bed. Damn it. How am I going to get through the night? I don't know. There you go. That can help. Um, eat slowly and chew your food thoroughly. Remain upright for one to two hours after meals. Elevate the head of the bed six to 12 inches using wooden blocks. And again, we have this issue of bending. We don't want to bend near the waist. Because if you bend at the waist, it's going to put pressure on the stomach that can push that fluid up through the esophageal sphincter. Never sleep. If you have GERD, you never want to sleep supine because, again, fluid's going to go the path of least resistance and creep up there and potentially go through that esophageal sphincter. I love this. If you're overweight, lose weight. <laughs> Fine. And why does obesity have anything to do with this? It pushes on the stomach, but also you have a bigger stomach. Bigger stomach, more food is in it. More food that's in there, you have a higher level of fluid. It's going to, uh, if you change positions, uh, go up to, to the esophagus. Do not wear constrictive clothing. And avoid heavy lifting, straining, or working in a bent over position. Why can't we lift something heavy? Why can't, why can't we strain? People that are large and obese often have larger BMs because they've eaten more food. So why is straining? I mean, so they have to strain to, to evacuate the bowels. Again, straining puts pressure on that abdominal cavity, which will press against the stomach, which will force food upward or downward. But remember, the duodenum is not a reservoir. The stomach itself is a reservoir. It can hold lots of stuff, but the duodenum is going to be small. So when we say push the food down, it's not going to push everything that's in the stomach into the duodenum because it's, it's too small. So it'll go the other path of least resistance, which could be the esophagus. Okay, so let's talk about uh, acute gastritis for just a minute here. So gastritis, we talked about inflammation with GERD of the esophagus. Gastritis is inflammation of uh, the stomach and the mucosa of the stomach. It can be acute or it can be chronic. And what happens with gastritis is that the protective mucosal barrier that protects the stomach tissue itself from all these acidic secretions um, to get broken down. It can become ulcerated and it allows the auto digestion from hydro uh, hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So what is basically happening is that those secretions, the very enzymes and uh, uh, things that the um, uh, highly acidic secretions that the stomach is stimulated to produce turn around and are injuring it. So GERD and, GERDs and gastritis can ultimately call, uh, cause ulcers of the stomach wall so the thing and that's gastritis because as it goes through the mucosal barrier there's not really an issue because the mucosal barrier um, doesn't have the nerve endings but now we go into the stomach wall and the tissue there how many of you have had an ulcer inside your mouth before oh my gosh does it hurt so bad it just erodes that tissue 
and her, her back and any kind of fluid coming up against it causes pain. Well, that's what's happening in your stomach there with gastritis. So do you think there's going to be abdominal pain? Yes. Nausea? Yes. Anorexia? If you're nauseated, I guarantee you, you have anorexia. Oh my gosh, I just realized, except when I was pregnant. <laughs> I just ate so I wouldn't throw up. Abdominal tenderness, reflux, belching. Uh, what is hematemesis? There you go. Um, however, now look at this. And this will be pretty much immediate, this abdominal pain. You will have eaten. You, it, it may be a, a slight at first, but it will, as the tissue erodes, and those acidic secretions get into that tissue and it's eating away, causing a deeper ulcer there, then it's going to be painful. Uh, so the, the pain may not be immediate while you're eating, but it'll be within one to two hours after there's been a, some good um, uh, secretions there. But look at this underneath there. If caused by contaminated food, it's, you're going to include um, a diarrhea and vomiting, and it will start within five to six hours after eating. There you go. <laughs> so if you sit there and you start feeling nauseated and you want to blame it on your host, whoever invited you over for dinner because it, you've got spoiled food or something, no, that will start five to six hours after you've eaten. All right, so here's the thing about peptic ulcer disease. So the key word that when we talk about gastritis, we're talking about itis, which again is inflammation. So the thing about peptic ulcer disease is where uh, you have, this is a chronic condition that's usually not acute unless you drink acid. <laughs> and then you'd have acute peptic ulcer disease. But this is going to be the cause of ulcerations through that mucosal barrier and into the tissues of either the esophagus, the stomach, or the duodenum. So really, when we say that the person has um, an esophageal ulcer, then that means it's going to be in the esophagus. Um, if they have a gastric ulcer, usually you're talking about the stomach, but look at where it usually will develop is in the dependent portion of this J-like structure, because this is where the acidic time sits the longest. And then a duodenal, 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 duodenal. Duodenal, that's how you say it. A duodenal ulcer sits in the uh, duodenum. Duodenum. Right there is where it sits. <laughs> You'll be old one day. And boy, would I laugh if I was still alive. All right, so esophageal ulcers are going to be secondary to GERDs. Gastric ulcers, again, are these erosions in the stomach wall um, and some toxic irritants. There's your smoking again. I've got to find out what the connection is to that. Unless you're getting some of that toxic smoke into the stomach because you're inhaling and some of that smoke will go down the esophagus into the stomach. I don't know. i got to be frank with you. Alcohol, food allergens, toxic chemicals, and H. pylori infection. It says smoking relaxes your esophageal sphincter. There you go. Makes sense, doesn't it? Thank goodness for Google, right? Immediate answers. And now I can put that in my lecture next time. And people will think I'm brilliant. Okay, so H. pylori infection. Here's the thing about H. pylori infection. It used to be people made fun of the guy who discovered it. And he took it to a conference and it, he was ridiculed for coming up with that theory. 
But it turns out today, after much research, that about 80% of gastric ulcers are caused by H. pylori bacteria. So what happens when we have bacteria? You put to treat them with an antibiotic. Yes, so they're much easier to uh, get rid of than you have if you have excessive stomach um, uh, secretions, um, gastric secretions, which are high in acidity, or you have incompetent bowels. When do you get incompetent bowels? With aging. We talked about that with um, the um, venous insufficiency, that they just start to wear out. And so they don't close tightly like they used to. They'll be really loose, or there just needs to be a little bit of secretions that come through. But the incompetent valves uh, happen frequently with elderly people, of which I am. Okay, so stress ulcers we didn't have in there. Let's go back for just a minute. There was one other kind of ulcer that I wanted to talk about, and that was stress ulcers. Um, so a, a, an acute stress ulcer um, can follow a severe illness, not just nursing school. I know you think it's all only people in nursing school get stress ulcers, but usually it follows a severe illness. Why do you think that? It is. When the body is under stress, then what elevates really fast? Cortisol. Exactly. That's why we have blood sugars in the hospital and the guy's not diabetic. The body just secretes a lot of cortisol. Um, the thing about it is stress ulcers tend to be very superficial and there tends to be um, a lot of them, not just one. Gastric ulcers tend to only be one because, again, it's sitting in that portion of the stomach that is uh, where most of the secretions sit most of the time. And, uh, and um, duodenal ulcers tend to be very deep, and they occur right after the sphincter after the pyloric sphincter that empties into the duodenum. Now, did I talk about aspirin over here and NSAIDs? Yes, I did. So aspirin and NSAIDs uh, can usually cause uh, gastric ulcers because they inhibit prostaglandins. And prostaglandins do what? You know that from anatomy and physiology. What does prostaglandin do? It protects the mucosa. Oh, mucosa. So you said that stress ulcers are superficial in what? There's many of them? Yes. Okay. Oh, here we go. Stress That's ulcers. Awesome. I just need to turn the slide a little bit. Here's a duodenal uh, ulcer. Look at how deep that sucker is. And that's fresh meat in there. So how do you think that's going to feel with more acidic secretions passed by there? Hurts. Hurts. All right. So here's a little chart here that talks about uh, the difference between gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers. Dang it. I can't believe it. That looks like another question to me. I don't know. I'm just saying. Just saying. Okay, so let's talk about how do we manage peptic ulcers here. And peptic ulcers, when we have the global term of peptic ulcers, we're talking about esophageal uh, ulcers, we're talking about gastric ulcers, we're talking about duodenal ulcers, we're talking about uh, stress ulcers. So there usually will be a combination of therapies. And I have to tell you right now that... 
these are not going to be on the test, but I wanted you to see them, how they control. Why aren't they going to be on the test? Because they're farm questions, and I don't have to do farm questions. Because uh, 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 I wouldn't know how to write them. I'm just saying. Okay, so just know there's a myriad of things that they use. They usually don't just use one uh, unless it's going to be an antibiotic for H. pylori disease. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to tell the people to, you know, reduce your stress. If work is too much for you, just let it go, let it go, let it go. Um, we want to avoid the NSAIDs. Um, we want to avoid alcohol and cigarettes and caffeine, again, because they stimulate um, the um, production of the gastric um, uh, secretions and i guess affect which would affect the valves um anyway pain management and here's the thing there may be certain foods that cause the pain so if you are really into spicy foods you tie people people that like really hot 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 mexican food whatever whatever's causing you pain you don't want to you don't want to eat it anymore and then you always want to monitor for blood in the stool or if there's blood in your vomit because you're nauseated because why it's not supposed to be there number one but also if you continue to not treat this you can ultimately end up with a perforation now why does a perforation such a big deal. It is the dirtiest, the GI system is the dirtiest system in the body. The dirtiest. And we're leaking into what? Which is? It's closed, but it's sterile. So now we've got all this bacteria, these toxins, eco material whatever getting into this sterile environment it's ultimately going to end up on any one of the multiple organs of the abdomen which is going to make that organ become contaminated infected which can lead to sepsis and then you're down the toilet to get that metaphor it's meant from one to the metaphor. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Too. All right, so what are the complications that we can have with these different peptic ulcer disease or any one of the type of ulcers that we talked about? Um, you can have hemorrhage. And hemorrhage is going to ultimately um, uh, um, cause all kinds of problems because you're going to become hypovolemic and you're, um, which are the whole reason for the last half of this list under hemorrhage, um, because it's going to deplete uh, the blood pressure. It is, and with with low blood pressure, you're going to have dizziness, syncope, uh, vertigo. Uh, you're going to have de uh, vascular dementia, which is caused by hypovolemia or anemia or not enough blood getting to the brain. Um, so this is going to be a huge, huge issue. And the thing about it is it can be very subtle with a cult blood. What is the difference between a cult blood and frank blood? A cult blood is hidden. You can't see it with a naked eye. So what is happening is that you can have this slow bleed and then turn hypovolemic. So when does it become uh, an emergency situation um, where there is a GI bleed? And there's an old, uh, I was telling my PN1 students the other day that there's an old nurse's joke that a nurse can diagnose seven different diseases by the smell of the feces. Well, GI blood is one of those diseases because it has a very distinct smell to it. 
and once you smell it, you know immediately what's happening. It's it's disgusting, but very distinct, just like C. diff, just like many things. So early recognition um, uh, is very important. Um, and that's why you're often attested when you tested when you go for a physical to the doctor's office so that you can determine if there's a cult blood. And again, that's why they send it to the mail. Because you may not have any problems, but we want to see is if there's any hidden blood in there because that means that there's something bleeding. And you may not have any signs or symptoms of it until you are so hypovolemic that you start experiencing. Uh, these dizziness, syncope, vertigo, may not even be pain. So uh, provide oxygen, start two large bowl IV lines, which are, are going to be uh, 18 gauge. And uh, because we're going to have to give you a transfusion. Um, again, hypovolemia can result in shock. Um, you want to do an H and H on the person, uh, any coagulation studies uh, to determine, um, you know, they may not have a, a, a huge um, uh, ulcer that's bleeding. It may be very, very small, but we want to determine uh, uh, exactly what is causing that to bleed. And, and if they come in in an emergency situation, how fast does it happen? So they're going to do a PT, PPT, INAR, or the um, activated uh, TNA. Medical interventions may include an NG tube placement and lavage. What the heck are we putting an NG tube for if you have uh, a GI bleed that's causing you to have all this um, black tarry stool? Why are we putting in a G tube? Pardon me? Lavage often is done with ice water. They will pull it up in a 60 mil syringe and shoot it down the NG tube into the stomach. But what we're trying to do there is to vasoconstrict the vessels that are causing uh, the bleed. That's how they warm people up too. If they have uh, uh, hypothermia, they will do uh, a, a lavage with warm fluids, or they may uh, um, inject fluid um, through an enema as well. People that have near drownings or that type of thing, they're trying to warm them up quickly. Okay, if there's a, a perforation, you got to know that there's going to be a sudden sharp pain. It may radiate up into the shoulders. And this, and especially the right shoulder. And the reason why the right shoulder, because there's a phrenic nerve that goes across the diaphragm. And so if that nerve is irritated by uh, excessive blood there, then there's going to be a uh, right shoulder pain. So the amount of pain is going to correlate with the uh, type of GI bleed and how much it's bled. Uh, I don't know if you've ever swallowed blood, but it's just this sickening feeling that's going to uh, make you nauseated. i got to turn my pages and see what that last line says there. Uh, oh, here it's under preparation. Just a minute. Um, okay, thank you for reading that. Still can't find it online. All right, so if a person comes in and they have uh, blood in their vomit, if they have blood in their stool, if they're nauseated, uh, what do you? What are we going to do? What is the, the, one of the first interventions we're going to do? <laughs> Who said it? Huh? What? Hemorrhage. We're talking hemorrhage. What is the first? 
thing a nurse is going to do. Vital signs. Vital signs. Is this going to let us know if they're hypovolemic? Yeah, it is. And they have very low blood pressure. So um, just keep that in mind when you're uh, seeing anything about written, anything about uh, um, hemorrhage in the future. Okay, so okay, so if a person is bleeding and their stomach is filling up with blood because they're not processing it fast, it's, it, the thing about it is, and I've talked about this before, is that the abdomen is very uh, is a res I mean the stomach is a reservoir. It can hold a lot of fluid. But you go down through the duodenal uh, sphincter into the duodenum, and now we're in a small space. This is really uh, problematic. <laughs> this is really what it causes dumping syndrome as well, is when there's too much fluid coming down into the duodenum, the duodenum stretches out because it can't hold all this fluid. And that's when you feel like you're bloating, you're cramping, you're not feeling good. With food, there is this shift of fluids because the food is either uh, salty or sweet and it's pulling more fluid uh, from the tissue of the small intestines here. So it's really, really bloated here. You can't really, you know, with that much, the bigger the intestine gets, whether it's small or large, the less strength it has for its peristalsis, so you just it makes you nauseated. It doesn't feel good at all. Well, that's what happens with the blood too. If there's a bleed, and uh, and it's significant, then it, there's too much blood that is going to go down into uh, the duodenum there too fast, and it, it's uh, going to cause anorexia and and um, nausea. Now. Uh, but if there's blood filling up the stomach here, or if there's been a perforation and there's blood now filling the abdomen, what are the clinical signs that you're going to find of a GI bleed? It's internal, so you're not necessarily going to see any outward signs of it. So internal, what are we going to find? For me, decreased blood pressure. It's definitely one because we've just taken the vital signs. They got a low blood pressure there. The abdomen blood does not absorb like fluid, so it's going to be you're going to have a distended abdomen. It's going to be firm. It's going to be rigid. It's going to be very painful when you touch it. Sometimes you'll see what looks like a bruising as the blood uh, is pushing through um, the tissues, but it's going to be when you feel a firm, distended, tender, rigid, it's a board-like rigidity to it, then you know that there's internal bleeding into the abdomen. You like my pounding of pulpit here? I get the biggest kick out of the way I teach. I don't know. Um, one thing too is we have had a little bit of uh, a perforation here. There is a tendency too to be have a low grade fever associated with that. And when we're talking low grade, we're talking a hundred, uh, around a hundred. It's not going to be high at all. And so how is the way, what are we going to have to do to stop the bleed, to correct this perforation? Have to dis, uh, do a scope to determine where the bleeding is. EJD maybe. EGD. Maybe laparoscopically do some cauterization. Maybe this is tissue here. So they can do it laparoscopically if it's very small. If it's further down the intestine, 
and they're going to have to do a resection. You don't always have to have an ostomy um, with a resection. They can cut out the little piece or they can sew it together. There's some options, but usually it will always involve surgery. Always, because we want to stop that leak into the abdomen. You guys want a break? I see some nodding here. Let's take a break. We'll come back at 20 after, and then we only go for a half hour. Whoop, whoop. Okay, we're back. We were just talking about uh, internal bleeding there in the hemorrhage. What is, what is, what are you looking at? So your patient comes in, they have a gastric ulcer there. They found occult blood. Now this may be a strategy that you want to implement with your test taking because information is going to uh, give you uh, the status, the patient's health status. So information that is found in the scenario or the stem of your of the question there. And that is, uh, are, they, are we seeing frank blood in the vomit? Are we seeing frank blood in the toilet? But I have prefaced the scenario with the person is not feeling good. They have um, uh, a history of GERD or uh, peptic ulcer disease. Um, we've taken their vital signs. Their vital signs are a little low. Um, and they have a history. Uh, they also have some cold blood. So when do we know that a situation has now become emergent? What is happening with the patient? Which you as a nurse are going to be responsible for being able to differentiate between having an acute situation going into an emergent situation. So what are some of the things that you're going to see? We just talked about a few. Blood pressure, low blood pressure, what else? What's happening with the abdomen? Distension, or it cannot be distended. Maybe they're a little bit uh, um, um, flat stomach. Maybe they're toned. Maybe they go to Vasa. But they sit there, and it's going to be a board-like rigidity to it. Uh, there may be some discoloration to it. We've seen that they have a low blood pressure. But i got to tell you, that as a nurse and somebody that has an abdominal bleed or perforation of the bowel anywhere, it doesn't really matter where, these people are going to look like crap. I'll just say it, it's shit. They're going to look terrible and they're going to feel terrible. They are going to have acute abdominal pain and the pain is going to be severe. Yes. Is it possible at all that you could have elevated blood pressure because there's so much fluid in there pushing on, like getting fever or stuff like that? Or um, I don't think so. I don't think so because that loss of blood is never going to get you uh, to the point where you're hypertensive. Now, pain in and of itself can cause hypertension, but you're in a closed well, then I guess system. If you have blood running. Really, and uh, you're losing blood is. outside of that cardiovascular system, it's going to be low. Okay. All right. So uh, this is when you go in, you have seen a change where the person has gone from acute to emergent. You have seen the change. So this is one of the strategies you need to implement when you're taking this test, whether it's my test or Chantel's or anybody. Uh, the NCLEX even, has there been a change? And if you have seen a change, what are you going to change for the worse? Who are you going to notify? The doctor, yeah. This is an emergent situation. If the bowel, if there has been a stomach ulcer, um, any kind of ulcer that has eroded through the wall of whatever organ we're talking about. 
Um, okay, so we talked about how the patient uh, looks. They look bad, they're pasty. Um, we talked about the firm uh, abdomen. Look and know those signs and symptoms of when a situation becomes emergent. Would it just be like if you've had one of those symptoms, or would it be when you have all of them that it becomes emergent? You know what? If the thing about it is, is what kind of perf is it? Is it a small or large? We don't know. We don't know. We're nurses. We don't have, you can't do an EGD and go down with a scope and look and see what's happening. We just know the patient has taken a turn for the worse. So we need to notice, uh, not, uh, um, notify the doctor. It could be one of those. Yes, yeah, so or they develop a low grade fever. Uh, pain, but pain is going to be a, a very much a part of it. It's going to be severe as well. All right, so let's say that we take our patient in for surgery, uh, for gastric surgery. So one of the things that we're going to um, have to do post-surgically for the patient is take care of the NG tube. Now, what does that mean? What are we going to do? You guys have passed off insertion of a G tube, uh, NG tube. So when we say care, take care of the NG tube, what do we need to do? Make sure it's patent, exactly. So we are going to flush it. We are going to, if necessary, we are going to aspirate. We want that fluid moving back and forth. You know, as a nurse, you need to kind of always look up at that suction thing on the wall, the container, and determine, okay, just make a mental note of where the level's at, and you go in an hour later, an hour and a half later, and notice that it's a sufficient or significant amount of fluid has been added to that container. Uh, number one, you know that the suction is working. We're putting the NG tube in there because we're trying to keep that stomach free of blood because it makes a person nauseated. And it allows us to determine how much of a blood loss there is if it's um, higher than uh, the um, duodenal ulcer. But we got to kind of mentally know and say, okay, it's there. And you come back an hour, hour and a half later, and you look at it, and it's half full. And yeah, we know that there is a significant blood loss there. So we need to do that. But the number one thing is to keep that uh, NG tube patent. I got to tell you, patients hate the NG tube because they can feel it going down the back of their throat. They don't like it. Um, if they have it for multiple days, then they're going to have start having some breakdown around the nair. We've got to look at that. We've got to make sure that the measurement, that it's still where you measured it to be. Uh, we need to have it inserted enough and that it's... Uh, Suctioning. Okay, so do we want the head of bed down or up? Up, exactly, because we want that gravity to keep it in the stomach because we don't want it migrating up into the esophagus. Uh, we want to turn, cough, and deep breathe. That is post-surgical. Any reason why the person has gone under general anesthesia. And why do I get emotional about that is because... This is part of pulmonary toileting. Turn, cough, and deep breathe. And we're doing that to try and keep the person from developing pneumonia. So whenever you see a question, what are the things the nurse is going to do for post-surgical patients? It's always going to be turn, cough, and deep breathe is one of the options. That's an option you want to check. And a progressive diet. How long do we keep that NG tube in? They've gone into surgery, it come out of surgery. And so usually we have the, the NG tube is placed in surgery if they didn't have it prior to. And so when do we pull the NG tube? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> what has to be there before you pull that NG tube? Think of what some of the post-surgical problems are or things that you got to deal with. This was in your fundamental class. One more time. Bowel sounds. Ding. That's it. We, we can pull it when they start having bowel sounds. 
Do we want to have it? Do we start them on a clear liquid diet before bowel sounds? Do we start them on a clear liquid diet while they still got the G tube? No, because then G tube will just suck it right out. Maybe they do periods of time where they'll like pause it and see how they tolerate without having the suction, and if they're still feeling nauseous and like still feeling like they have to throw up or keep it in. It all depends. Do they have bowel sounds? Because we don't want them having anything in their stomach until they have bowel sounds. We got to wait, and and that bowel that intestines that whole gi thing is going to sleep during general anesthesia goes to sleep you gotta wake it up you gotta there's not a lot you can do to wake it up the patient themselves just innately have to realize that they're awake and start peristalsis again they may give one or two eye chips ice chips um uh, to have that stimulate peristalsis, but we've got to have bowel sounds on that. All right. Now, what's going to happen here with hemorrhage? Possible complications after surgery is that it's hemorrhage. We've talked about this a little bit. It can be anywhere uh, from a scant bloody drainage, um, um, which is expected. That is always going to be expected for the first 24 hours anyway anytime somebody goes inside and manipulates that with any kind of instrument there's a potential for irritation or tear it could be very 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 minor it is expected within 24 hours after surgery for a GI any type of GI surgery so we don't really worry about that but then we just need to know how much we're talking about when we're talking about a scant amount of drainage Keep an eye open uh, for it there to determine if they start increasing that uh, uh, amount of blood they're losing or any time that there's an excessive amount of bleeding, we want to uh, report that to the surgeon. Um, we're going to assess the dressing, the surgical dressing. If they went laparoscopically, there, there's just little, three little small incisions, but if they had to open up the... Um, abdomen for uh, the surgical procedure, then we want to constantly assess the uh, incision and the dressing and decision itself. So we see, again, we have just gone in invasively to the dirtiest organ of the body. So we got to see, you know, what's happening there. Guess what they're doing? My daughter had cancer surgery about four years ago. And uh, uh, had a, um, a colon cancer. She had a big old tumor that totally occluded uh, the GI tract, occluded the colon. So um, uh, guess what she came out of? They, they cut her from, from the entire length of her abdomen. But what? guess what she came out with? I wish I'd come up with these ideas. It, it was the most amazing thing. Clear down her incision. She was stapled shut, but clear down her incision. There was a um, wound back dressing. And why do they do that? To suck any of that noxious fluid that may leak because of the surgical process out of the abdomen to reduce infection for an abdominal surgery. Isn't that interesting? It's only on for two or three days, but what they're trying to do is suck any of that contaminated excess secretions or drainage from being open, from the intestine being open during the surgery. Very interesting, I thought. All right, so, um, um, I think I talked, we talked about the NG tube. Uh, it's going to be put onto suction after surgery. Just be aware of that. And then um, we talked, I mentioned earlier a little bit about dumping syndrome. This usually occurs about 30 minutes after eating. You learned about that in fundamentals. Um, we'll talk about it again. Uh, we talked about it earlier again about this uh, too much, too fast of this kind can, coming through the duodenum. 
Um, we talked about that it's going to cause a bloating, cramping. A person can get really diaphoretic. They can feel like they're going to faint and pass out. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. And what we want them to do if they have a tendency to do this, number one, slow down <laughs> with the eating. Yeah. And number two is that, you know how we talked about that um, if there's an increased risk for aspiration or the food going up the esophagus, then we don't want the person to lay down. But if we have dumping syndrome, then we want to have the person sitting up for at least three hours after surgery. And we, I mean, not after surgery, after the meal. And so again, slow down their eating. And we do want the food to, again, come through the duodenal ulcer. We just want it to slow down. So um, um, that could be anywhere from 90 minutes to uh, three hours after eating. OK. Another thing that you, you know how you kind of on this all of a sudden remember what you were going to say. Another thing that you can do, especially on fluid, if the person is eating fluids um, or taking formula, that type of thing, you may want to thicken those fluids to slow down how fast it goes through the stomach if they are on too thin. Okay, we only have about 15 minutes left. I'm just sick about it, aren't you? You guys lose your energy. Have you noticed that? It starts going down the toilet. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about these inflammatory bowel. Who's ever heard of uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome, IBS? How many of you have watched that commercial on TV and you flip it every, every time you start to see it come on, you just change channels? Yeah. Well, it's quite the problem here in the United States. So let's talk about uh, the first one is going to be um, um, diverticulosis or diverticulitis. Um, so I'm going to go back for, I want to show you this one slide so you can get a visual while I'm talking because uh, maybe you'll understand. What happened? What happened? I don't know. All right, so this is right here, right here. Let's see if we can get this slideshow current. Okay, so here this is right over here. We see this is a polyp. So the polyp is going to go towards the lumen, it's going to go inside the intestines and usually it's found in the colon so diverticulosis on the other set uh, uh, hand is an outpouching so on the external uh, it uh, it goes outward towards the cavity the uh, abdominal cavity it is uh it's just this little thing here and this usually occurs with aging um, because of wear and tear on the bowel. So it's not a big deal unless it becomes ulcerative. I'm not. Unless it becomes diverticulitis. So diverticulosis is when there is no inflammation there. Diverticulitis is when there is inflammation there. And that's when it's going to be uncomfortable for the patient. So what is happening here is that because of wear and tear on the colon, all of a sudden, you know, the, the colon um, is going to start having these little out pouches all around. Now, as the feces travels down through the colon here, then when you eat a fat, high fat diet, um, your stool is not firm and formed. It becomes sticky. Yeah the best way to describe it. A high fat diet makes it sticky. And so as you have this sticky feces traveling through your colon, parts of it, like you see right here, get into those little pouches. Does that gross you out? Because it grosses me out personally. 
So it gets into these little pouches there, and you, it's full of toxins. I'm trying to get you to see the visual here. And so the toxins start to erode the sides of the, the colon. And so one, when diverticulitis is frequent and severe, because the person really likes high fat food, then at some point, one of these little pouches can perforate. So what do we do about diverticulitis here? First of all, um, uh, the person could uh, have constipation or diarrhea. It depends on what's going on in there. Um, they could have black tarry stools because, again, these little pouches that have become infected, diverticulitis, are going to start getting thinner, eating through, eroding through the tissue, the uh, uh, colon wall. Um, the person will have, uh, could have bloody stools. They could uh, have polyps over here. Um, and we talked about, uh, we're not talking about this particular slide. So let's go back now and see. The thing about diverticulosis is that because it's a chronic disease that occurs uh, usually in elderly people, then what happens here is that people don't know that they have this problem, these little out pouchings here. They don't know it. They don't care. They keep getting their fatty food. And then all of a sudden, when you have a perforation of the wall of the colon, what are you going to have? Pain. <laughs> it's really severe pain. And so, again, you're going to have this leakage of the fecal material out of the enclosed colon into the abdominal um, cavity, which is going to cause problems. So diverticulitis is a, and the inflammation there that can occur, it's going to cause somebody to have a low-grade fever. Um, and the thing about it is, is that, you know, this is going, the area of the colon that's affected, and I don't know if you can see all these little out patchings here, but there's more than just one little pouch in there. It's all through the colon. So the potential there for perforation is really high and can cause some um, real problems there. So uh, if you are, if the person is experiencing constipation, because constipation can go over these things um, and uh, tear at the little pouch, because again, the walls are much thinner here and cause some bleeding. If there's constipation, we want to put in a, a stool softener. If there's diarrhea, uh, then we um, need to treat for diarrhea. So uh, there's, again, diverticulosis is going to have a gradual onset, onset. It is not going to be acute unless those little pouches start getting full of fecal material and those little areas are going to get very, very inflamed, uh, uh, be very uncomfortable, be painful, and then possibly have a perforation. Usually people will rate their pain level between like five and seven when they have diverticulosis. Um, so they can have intermittent rectal bleeding. They can have occult blood. Um, their white blood cell count can be up because of the infection that is starting to develop. Itis, remember that, is associated uh, with inflammation. Um, and uh, the what is the lab value for inflammation that is indicative of inflammation in the body somewhere? ESR. Yes. Yes, it's true. ESR, yeah. uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Uh, they'll have a slight low-grade fever. They will have be uh, slightly tachycardic. And um, they can have pus in the stool. They can have excessive music and mucus in the stool. It's very, very uncomfortable for them. And sadly, it's very common. So let's go back for just a minute and uh, talk about that. How do you think we can prevent or a, a diverticulitis? We can't always prevent diverticulosis, but how can we prevent diverticulitis? 
Diet, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what kind of diet do we want to have? Low fat. Low fat, high fiber. You want firm formed brown stools. Okay, I think we have time to talk a little bit about Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. These are other inflammatory bowel diseases, and that's what we're focused on right now. We talked about uh, GERDs. We talked about peptic ulcer disease. We've talked about inflammatory bowel, and that's where we're at. So when you're organizing your notes, we want to have at least... Up, up to this point, three different categories that we're looking at so we can compare signs and symptoms and what we do for each. So Crohn's disease is an inflammation of the small intestine um, or the colon, but usually it's a small intestine there. It usually ends up in the terminal portion of the ileum, which is at the very end of that 20 feet. It's near the end. It's right very close to the ileal cecal valve there. Um, and if necessary, I mean, not if necessary, sometimes it'll migrate over to the large uh, colon. Also, tip colitis, on the other hand, is uh, inflammation mostly of the rectum and the rectosigmoid colon, which is at the very, very end of the large intestine, next to the asshole. Thank you, whoever was le uh, uh, listening earlier. Um, but the thing about the ulcerative colitis is going to extend to the last portion or the large intestine. The ulcerative colitis can literally go through the entire colon. So think about this for just a minute. Both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are gonna be basically the same thing, and that's where you have ulcers. Um, with Crohn's disease, you have patches of irritation. But with ulcerative colitis, you have actual ulcers. Now think about that canker in your mouth and the colon. Don't think about them together. But how painful that that hanker in your mouth is when you're drinking any any kind of flavored stuff, water is not too bad, but it's still a little bit painful. But anything else up against that just ooh, sends you right down. Now think about that in your colon. And the fecal material passing it and rubbing up against it every time. They're ulcers. They're raw. They're just, oh, it's so painful. And you have excessive diarrhea. Now, Crohn's disease, again, is mainly f affecting the upper intestine or the small intestine. And you have maybe five or six loose stools a day. With ulcerative colitis, yeah. And remember, what does the large intestines do? It's absorbing all the fluid here. So the, the feces that has traveled through the small intestine now hits the large intestine, and you have all these ulcers there. And so the lumen is not affecting it like it should. So what do you have? You have the shits. You have 20 or 30 diarrhea episodes in a 24-hour period. I had a, a friend's daughter had this, and she she had a um, baby, which, as the baby was coming through the birth canal, compressed the colon, damaged the colon, totally inflamed the entire colon. She went to the hospital. What are we, I'm missing this. What are we talking about? Oh, anyway, so she had she had to log in the hospital how many episodes of diarrhea she had, and she had 54 of them in a 24-hour period. And you're talking about very acidic fluid here going up against that ulcer. So you're going to have bleeding. Oh, my gosh, it's the most painful thing in the world. And here's another thing. Is any of that fluid getting it uh, absorbed? 
it's not getting absorbed. So what do you think the person's going to, you're going to have to monitor for as a nurse? Thank you. Dehydration. Exactly. We've got one minute. Let's see where we're going with that. Yes, you're going to want to compare all of this. And so just be sure I put it all there for you. And so here's what we're going to do with this. Uh, we have to do all these four things that we're going to focus on, just like we had four things that we focus on for uh, heart failure. There are four things here that we want to uh, focus on. So you need to know all of this. Medications you're going to do. Um, prednisone, you're going to do steroids so that the, you reduce inflammation. Now, can we uh, use steroids always? No. no, we can't. So really, they're only used during periods of exacerbation. But usually these people are given enemas. And do you think they're going to do a high enema or a low enema? Or ulcerative colitis? Low. High. Oh. We're high. And they're going to turn side with their medicated specially prepared enemas you're going to turn with medication they're going to turn 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 every night to try and get those ulcers to heal how fun is that did you go back and look at the age over here of where you're looking at over here for ulcerative colitis 15 to 25 years of age at college where do you live in college? In a dorm room with your roommate. And you got to give yourself the colon every single or an enema every single night. And you got to roll from side to side to side to side in between those two twin beds in that very small room. So do you have to be best friends with your roommate who understands this? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because it has to happen every single night. <laughs> I know. All right, so uh, medications, with, uh, nutritional uh, therapy, um, and uh, one of the, not the faculty, but an employee here in this very building um, has Crohn's disease. He's never taken a day of medication. Oh, I just, he's a male. Anyway, he's never taken a day of medication in his life. Why? Because he has controlled it with his diet. Very strict. So your exacerbations can come on because of your diet. Um, they think that Crohn's is an autoimmune, but also uh, con uh, genital. It's a hereditary um, um, thing. So it could be uh, happen uh, if you have this. Oh, my gosh, I'm out of time. We're stopping right now. I'm done. You're dead to me. Go away. <laughs> we'll continue this tomorrow morning. This, this really titillating lecture. It is titillating, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>